your Bibles tonight and turn to Matthew 13, verse 33. You say, that's it, verse 33? Yep, it's a little parable, but it carries a punch. We are going through our parable series, as you know by now, and we are in the study of number four in our time together. And we're looking tonight at the parable of the leaven, or uh, the leaven bread. Really, the leaven. What does leaven mean? We would say, though it's not exactly the same, we would say in our culture today, we don't, you don't, we don't talk about the word leaven. It's a Middle Eastern concept and understanding, and for that matter, it's a Genesis, uh, book of Genesis um, announcement by God to us about what leaven is and what it stands for. We would say today yeast. What yeast does to a loaf of bread or to, uh, to dough, uh, leaven does uh, the same. But the Bible's very clear about this. The parable of the leaven. What is Jesus going to teach us about regarding it? Um, as you're there in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, uh, look with me just back at the beginning of that chapter. In Matthew 13, 1, the Bible there says, And on the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, and a great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then verse 3 says, he spoke to them many things in parables, the parabolic teaching of Jesus. In our introduction of this series, we talked about how it's Jesus speaking, using parables, and what it does is bring the truth of God in what we said as technicolor revelation, technicolor truth. There's no way that you can hear a parable, now listen, and as it's given, it is so profound that the way God engineered a parable, you either get it or you don't get it. And when a parable goes out, it unlocks, as it were, the ears of the hearer in one way. In other words, those who want to hear from God, listen, this could be you tonight. If you want to hear from God, guess what? You are going to hear from God. And if you don't want to hear from God, this is what the other aspect of a parable does. If you don't want to hear the same truth that unlocks the mind of the person that's willing, that same truth slams the door on the heart that doesn't want to know. A parable is like a catalyst that digs deep into the thinking and the kaleidoscope of your mind in a pictorial way, and it either causes great blackness and shuts you down, or it causes greater light to take place. It's absolutely awesome. It's profound. And Jesus used parables. And so tonight we look at Matthew 13, 33, the parable of the leaven. Look at it with me there. It says, another parable, he, Jesus, spoke to them, and he said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. And every Jew, in the hearing of what Jesus is saying now, their ears are up, and they're wondering, what on earth is this going to tell us? And you'll know why in a moment. Which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Note takers, mark down Luke 13, 20. This parable is echoed in Luke's gospel Chapter 13, verse 20 and 21, again, he, Jesus, spoke to them and said, What shall I like in the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was leavened. The growth of this leaven in the measure of the meal. The uh, meal being not uh, bacon and eggs and all this other stuff. The meal being the, we'll say, loaf or the dough that's present. Jesus is teaching about something very profound here, but let's take some time to get into some background here. If you think about it, church, listen carefully. Why would Jesus use this kind of teaching? It's pretty awesome. If you'll think about it, God has given us, as I've mentioned in times past in other teachings, God has given us, I believe, in a sense, two Bibles. Now hear me out. Two Bibles this way. There is no doubt in my mind that it is obviously the Word of God, this Bible that I'm holding. God has given us the Bible, absolute truth. But it's interesting that in the Bible, the Bible speaks about those who, in this world, who may not have access to the Bible, are by no means excused from the truth of the Bible. Isn't that interesting? You know, there's always that person that will say, um, 
you know, well, what about the guy that's in Africa or the guy that's in South America who's never heard the Bible? Everybody, isn't it interesting? Everybody, uh, or so many people, I should say, are so concerned about the guy that's never heard the Bible, and yet the guy that's arguing with you about why they don't need Jesus, they're hearing the Bible, and all of a sudden they're so compassionate about the guy that in South America that's never heard about the Bible. That's ridiculous. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the guy down in South America who's never heard or seen a Bible, that God is speaking to that person by his creation in which the guy lives in so that he is so without excuse before God regarding God's attributes even. Isn't it amazing? That somehow the guy walking around in the jungles of South America, God is revealing himself to the psyche of that, my, of that man in his mind and heart that I'm God. Now, how does God do that? I don't know. That's God's business. The Bible says God reaches the guy running around half naked with a bone in his nose and a spear in his hand that that guy is having to choose or reject the revelation of God. Listen, God has given us the Bible, which by the way, think of this. What was the first book to roll off the printing press? Bible. What was the first book to go electronic? Bible. What was the first book to uh, outsell all books every year ever since it was uh, published? Bible. Um, It's interesting. What book is preached on and what book is announced and what book is uh, broadcast by radio, by TV? No other writings of any other religious founders in the world and world history but the Bible. Think of it. I remember many years ago, I don't remember what year it was, maybe you do, but I remember one time Billy Graham was preaching and they were using all this satellite stuff and they did a world outreach and Billy Graham was preaching the gospel to 2.5 billion people in one service. That's awesome. Never before happened. And what did he do? He preached the Bible from the Bible, God's word. But the other Bible that I'm talking about is that revelation of creation that God has given, meaning this. Honestly, think for a moment, because you and I, humanity, I mean, you, I, us, humanity, we've been polluted by and we've been manipulated by uh, spin, manipulation, bias of an unbelieving world. If you look at the mountains, the clouds, animals, your skin, your life, the world, the heavens. Doesn't the Bible say that the heavens declare the glory of God? The Bible says there's no place where you can go to escape the witness of the stars that are in the sky. A normal person, a normal person could walk outside, never read in a Bible and say, wow, what's up with this? This is amazing. Who did this? A normal person would say, there's got to be a God, and I need to find out who he is. Jesus takes parabolic teaching and uses everyday natural common things to communicate the reality of the spiritual world. You can watch a butterfly before it's ever a butterfly. What's that thing doing? It's crawling around your yard with all these legs and all these feet. It's a caterpillar. And it goes up the side of your house and hangs out there until springtime. And then it flies away. And the Greeks called that metamorpho, metamorphosis. Something, this is amazing. Are you ready for this? Something that is earthbound goes up the side of your house and turns itself into basically the consistency of snot. It goes from a caterpillar to like snot. And, and then when all that has its chemical work, it winds up breaking out of that chrysalis and it and it's, and it's, brings out its wings and it dries its wings and all of its glory, it flies away. And it's the same thing that was walking on the ground. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine like, well, you know, this, now this is living, man. No more earthbound And you look at that, and you could see pictures of resurrection. You put a seed into the ground at this time of the year. You put a bulb in the ground, and it dies, and then out of its death comes forth a shoot and a brand new flower and a plant. It's a beautiful thing. How does that happen? It was living, it died, and it's alive again. 
if we would just look at what God is speaking to us with an open heart and a mind that is honestly simple, then the existence of God makes sense. The things of God makes perfect sense. And when Jesus taught, he taught using natural things to relate to us. And it is an awesome thing to realize. Now, as we get into this teaching on leaven, mark this down because uh, you can look at various scholars based upon how they were instructed or brought up and they'll argue about this thing called leaven. But let's let the Bible interpret the Bible. So in your note taking, write down what is leaven, for example, in the scriptures. Well, Exodus 12, 15 says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. By the way, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. During the whole rest of the other time, you eat leavened bread. But there's a uh, celebration before the Lord. What is this? Passover. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread. And on the first day you shall remove leaven from your house. Why would you take leaven out of your house? What's that all symbolic for? And during that time, you are eating unleavened bread. What's God saying to us? For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. This is in Egypt. When they're coming out of Egypt, God says, this is the deal. Leaven is a picture of uncleanness or sin. Get it out of your house and throw it out. Because why? Because for the next seven days, we are sanctifying ourselves to God. The nation of Israel would do this. They do it to this day. And you will eat unleavened bread. Why? What is that? It's a sense of purification. But why would the Bible, in an act of purification and devotion to God, why didn't the Bible pick on avocados? Why didn't the Bible pick on tomatoes? There's a lot of other stuff. Because of the properties of leaven. A little speck of leaven expands. It actually ferments. It turns into a toxin or it turns into something that is rotting and it grows or it infiltrates the rest of the dough. Yes, it smells fantastic. We love the smell of it. You like the smell of a bakery, don't you? Oh, mm, fanta- oh boy. It's when- oh, boy. Well, listen, I understand that. But God says, okay, you know what the characteristics of is that it starts out so small and it grows so much. And the act of it is that it rots whatever it comes in contact with. So I know we love it and we love the way it tastes, but God says it's, it, it rots things. Now, don't get all upset like, oh, we'll never eat leavened bread again. No, there's times in Scripture when God commands his people to eat leavened bread. There's a reason for it. It's pretty interesting. You can study that later on your own. Exodus 34, 25 says, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Isn't it interesting? This is a side note. God says to the nation of Israel, when you offered the sacrifice with blood, make sure there's no leaven in the whole offering. Jesus was the bread of life. And the scripture makes it very clear that he is our Passover and that he was unleavened. Isn't that cool? And he was also, look, he was also the sacrifice of blood. And God said, from Exodus, don't mix leaven with the sacrifice of blood. And Jesus is the perfect word of God. God come down to earth to die on the cross for us. And Jesus of himself said, I am the bread of life. Every Jew that heard Jesus say that went, wow. He's meaning that he's not Leavened bread. They understood that. He is speaking of himself as being unleavened bread. Pure bread, pure. Isn't that cool? I love that. Matthew 16, 6 and 12. Matthew 16, 6 and 12. Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the priests were out there selling bread? No, verse 12 says, Matthew 16, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Why? Because it was corrupt. So church, as we look at this parable of the leavened bread, mark this down. Number one, we're looking at the technicolor truth in parables, the leaven. Number one is dangers over time. He's warning us about dangers 
over a protracted period of time. He says another parable, he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The concept of leaven is this, that something is corrupt in the mix. The kingdom of heaven. Now, those of you who've been coming to this study, you know that Jesus has been challenging us and warning us. Remember, the sower goes out to sow seed. And in the midst of all the wonderful acts of spreading out the seed, Jesus said, is the word of God. There are those whose hearts will not receive it. In the positive, there's a negative, okay, in the parable. And then we talked about uh, last week, the mustard seed, that it's a good start, but it grows into such a great tree, which is tremendous, but the birds of the air lodge in its branches. With the positive, there's the negative. And this is how parables work. And so now Jesus is telling us the kingdom of heaven, which you guys know now is the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the kingdom of God, the church age. The last 2,000 years is like this, Jesus said. There's going to be leaven. So we begin to process this. Pretty exciting. Jesus warns us and challenges us that I'm talking about the long haul of the doctrine of God in the world. In Matthew 24, mark this down. This is exactly what he's talking about. Matthew 24, 12 Jesus said, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Think of that. Look, leave that on the screen. Think of that for a moment. This, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. I just mentioned Billy Graham preached 2.5 billion people. What, what, what did that mean? Was that, was that of any biblical significance? Of course it was. But not everybody was reached, were they? Jesus said as we approach the end, there's going to be heartless people, as cold as ice, unloving. Oh, and by the way, one of the other signs will be the word of God will be preached all around the world. It's too bad, huh, that the word of God being preached all around the world doesn't cause everybody to be loving. Wouldn't that be nice? And Jesus is telling us that not only is the word of God preached, now look, I don't want to start a riot here tonight, but understand this. Are we supposed to preach the gospel to every creature? Yes. Are we not supposed to go out in all the world and preach the word of God? Yes. Are we not supposed to have missionary ventures? Yes. But clearly we will not reach all people on earth. How do you know? Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation in two places that there's going to come a time during the tribulation period that because of the gospel, though it is, listen, it is going out tremendously during the tribulation period, John says there's going to be so many people saved you can't count them all. But there's still something wrong. What is it? Before the end can happen, which is the reference here, book of Revelation answers Matthew 24, before the end of the world can take place, or I should say the end of the age as we know it, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period yet to come, something has to take place. The gospel has to be preached in all of the world and then the end comes. Do we have any record of that in the Bible? Yes. The Bible says that in the book of Revelation, God will dispatch his angels and they will fly through the midst of the atmosphere. This is going to be awesome. And they proclaim the everlasting gospel to all the inhabitants of the earth, and then the end comes. Wow. Wouldn't it have been amazing if last week that meteor going across over <laughs> Russia would have said, Hey, everybody, Jesus Christ is Lord, died on the cross, rose again from the grave. He's Savior of the world. Can you imagine if that out of that fireball, this voice came out? Can you? Oh, man. Well, there's going to be a day when a couple of angels, the Bible says, is going to fly through the atmosphere. Not space, atmosphere. What's it going to look like? I don't know. I'll be watching from up there, watching them below us do the job, according to Revelation 19. So, the end, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. That's an awesome thing. But listen to this. 
We're talking about a time, and we're talking about a time now when Jesus says, from the birth of the church to the end of the church age where the church is raptured up into heaven, that's what culminates. The church was born when the Spirit came down, and the church will graduate when it goes up in the rapture, whenever that comes. If it's next week or 100 years from now, that's when the church graduates. We don't know when that's going to be. But all along the way, the Bible warns us, Jesus tells us, that one of the characteristics of the work of the church and the earth is that it's going to be tainted by things from both outside and inside seeking to destroy the church. I got news for you. This is not very encouraging, what I'm going to say. But church is going to suffer greater attacks. Church is going to be brought under tremendous persecution at some point in time, increasingly so. According to the Bible, there is going to be a false church arise. It's going to look great, but it's going to be off on doctrine. It's going to be askew on doctrine. And the true church, according to the Bible, unless the Lord comes back, you remember what Jesus said? Unless I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Wouldn't it be amazing if, if it all was reversed? Nah, it's not going to work that way. You and I do not, listen church, you and I do not want and nor do we believe that we can be such great Christians that we can take the place of this parable and we're the leaven and we are so good and we grow so much and the church gets so big that we wind up filling up the whole world and making it one big Christian happy world. But listen, there are some guys, I'm not going to name their names, but they're big time right now. They believe what I just said. They believe, they're famous people, you know them, they're household names. They believe that we're going to grow so big, the Christian church, which I think is absolutely insane to think. The church is going to get bigger, and things are going to get better, and uh, we're going to create a kingdom on earth. We're going, to bring, we're going to make it all so good that Jesus has to come back because we make it so good. We are going to permeate the earth, and they use this parable for their actions. This very parable. They twist the very meaning of it. No, no. My Bible tells me that we are going to decline. I don't know how that makes you feel, but uh, take your feelings and throw them out the window. <laughs> Because the Bible says things are going to get tough. And the church is going to be persecuted. When? What pastor, when? I don't know. I think the church is already under persecution. It certainly is in the world. How bad will it get for us? I don't know. What does it matter? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. Why should we escape when our brothers and sisters right now, I just got an email where there's brothers and sisters that are dying in North Africa. On a daily basis, there's Christians dying right now because of their faith. Leaven. Dangers over the long haul. The church is going to experience difficult time. Why? Because leaven is infiltrating. And we'll, we'll address the exactness of what leaven is in a moment. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to this. This is all under the argument of dangers over time. Why? Because of leaven in and around the church. 2 Timothy 3.1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times, church, circle that in your Bible, perilous times. The word means to shave off, to scrape down, to whittle away strength and power. In the last days, last times, scraping of power and scraping of strength will happen for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sounds like a lot of people working for us up in Sacramento right now. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. What did I just, what did the Bible just say? From such people turn away. Is that radical? Huh? Do you think that's radical? Wow. Oh my goodness. Church, are you guys with me? Are you listening? The Bible says in the last days, evil is going to wear on you like a, like a contractor or a, or a carpenter planing a piece of wood until it goes from a four by four to a toothpick. Perilous times 
are going to be coming. And here's the deal. As a Christian that's going to hold on to the word of God, it's going to cost you. To those who are going to look religious, but they are going to compromise, it's not going to cost you anything. It's going to be easy for you. And you need to choose tonight. Think about it. To obey God in his word, to follow him, and to say, Lord, I want your word lived out of my life. Remember, Jesus told it to us this way. He said, watch out when all men speak well of you. For so they did the false prophets who came before you. This is tough stuff, but it's necessary stuff. This slow shaving off is like, in my mind, Samson getting a haircut. What a knucklehead that guy was. Flirting around, oh, you know, playing all these games. You know, she finally caught on eventually. Started cutting his hair, and there's a covenant with him and God. And think about it, with every bit of cutting, the, cutting of his hair. Now, look, it wasn't that he had so much protein in his hair that he kept flexing his muscles and, oh, my gosh. Like his hair is like kryptonite or something. It was this outward symbol of an internal commitment he had with God. And he started flirting with the power of God and this knucklehead girl and, you know, well, whatever. And he got sloppy. Samson, with his hair getting shaved off, lost his strength. God rescinded his anointing from his life. And you know the story. Got his eyes cut out, among other things. Wound up costing his life. But what was he doing? Samson, perhaps, like the church today, or the organized church today, tolerated things. Became very tolerant. Our culture is so sad. In, in religiosity today, in Christianity today, the word tolerant has become some sort of a badge of honor. It's almost like if you speak out against the word tolerant, you're somehow from, you know, from Mars or something. But let me remind you, I challenge all of you, especially educators, go look up what the word tolerant or tolerance means in the most ancient English dictionaries, and you will be shocked. It's completely not what it means today in our schools. Look up Noah Webster's Definition of tolerance. See, what are you bringing this up for? Because, listen, a godless form of tolerance uses words like acceptance. Look, we all want to be accepted. But it prostitutes things. That's part of the leaven. It creeps in. You guys, every one of us, all of us, I'm pointing at me first. The leaven has already crept into the way you and I think. It's already in your life. And now things that are being spun and declared, made law, or it's vogue, or the Hollywood clan says it's so, and the Bible, is, the Bible stands there like this. It's, it has said the same thing for thousands of years. And listen, I'm only, I'm only asking us, when you see what the trend is proclaiming, and you see what the Bible says, are you ever tempted or thinking, yikes, uh... I believe what the Bible says, but I better be quiet about that other thing and that other direction. Oh, boy. Woo! Leaven is advancing in our lives. It's everywhere, but God doesn't excuse it. And 1 Corinthians 5, this is a perfect example. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, Paul says to the church at Corinth, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven, whoop, leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, <laughs> since you truly are unleavened. You guys are saved at Corinth. What are you doing tolerating stuff that's ungodly? For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Isn't that awesome? Now look, hypothetically, before we move on, hypothetically, you go to, you go to class tomorrow, and there, is, there are certain things on your high school or college campus that it is expected of you to believe. Did you know that? 
It is expected of you to believe. It's expected of you to think. It's expect, and if you deviate from that, you will pay the price. I had a sweet uh, brother here at this church, a wonderful man of God. Um, he was telling me Sunday, I'm going to be going before this panel for my possible job, and it's a big deal, very big deal. And these guys, he's going to he's going to do. Uh, I think it'll be uh, grilled on an oral exam. And he comes up before these officials, and they're going to ask him stuff. He's got to do it. And um, I'm listening to him, and we prayed. But I told him, he just seen his eyes. He went, he was, he didn't know what to say. I said, whatever you do, if they say to you, "Are you a religious man?" Say, yes. Don't say anything more than that. If they come back to that and they say, do you believe in God? Say, yes. If they say, if they keep pressing it, listen, young people today, if you're on the college campus, listen to what I'm saying. If they start pressuring you and prodding you, know this, nothing good's going to come out of it. Jesus already told us this. Jesus said, keep your mouth shut because you don't throw the pearl before swine. And I said, whatever you do, buddy, don't go up in front of that council and think you're going to preach the gospel to them. And even if they ask you, don't answer. You could say, I'll meet you later after. If you want to talk, we can talk later. But don't, don't speak about that. Listen, some of you, you go to court. You put your hand on the Bible. You swear an oath, and that's all fine and dandy. But don't go up there in front of the court or the judge or the attorneys and start giving the four spiritual laws. You're gone. I'm telling you, they'll dust you. Why? Because they have already been completely consumed by leaven. And you might as well be speaking Martian to them. Be very careful. The next danger is this, danger from within. Danger from within. Jesus said, a woman came and hid the leaven. This is covert. It's unknown. Something's wrong. Whoever and whatever she is, and I'll give you my opinion. It's only my opinion. In the context of leaven being sown, leaven being something that is bad and grows and affects the whole group, and the... Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven. We're all on safe ground right now. If you apply that biblically, again, always let the Bible interpret the Bible, you will come up with thoughts like this. Jesus warned in the seven letters to the seven churches, there are those who have that evil doctrine of Jezebel, the woman who brought in spiritual adultery and fornication into the church. Interesting, huh? Think of that. Babylonianism, false worship, whatever is going on, a woman sneaks it in. I believe, look, Jesus is not picking on women. I think he's warning us that in the last days, to those of us who are reading this in the 21st century, there will be a false church who the book of Revelation says is a harlot with robes who rides upon the back of the beast, a false church in the last days. I think he's warning us. And I think the more you get down the hallway and corridor of time and you approach the last days, it will be even more clear. And she's hiding something. Listen, the gospel, the gospel is to be proclaimed, not hidden. It's to be preached, not snuck. Snuck. That sounded funny. Sneaked. <laughs> Snookered. <laughs> Dangers from within. Acts uh, 20, verse 29, Paul the Apostle said, For I know this. This is one of the most sweetest, tender things you've ever read. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
What are they going to do? Are they going to come riding in? Are, they, are these savage wolves going to become, they're going to ride in and they're just going to start like throwing up on all the little lambs and sheep and, and you know, what are they going to do? Listen, are they just going to, is there going to be meat and ears and sheep nose flying? And no, no, none of that. He's talking spiritual. There's going to be wolves that come in and what do they do? Bring leaven. They bring false doctrine, false teaching. A little bit will corrupt. Dangers from within. Look what he says. Verse 30, also, from among your own selves men will rise up. Inside the church. Speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That's their goal, by the way. Therefore, watch and remember that for the space of three years, I did not cease to warn you night and day with tears. This is the apostle. Isn't that amazing? Wow, he cried about the coming wolves and false doctrine. Church, listen, can you hear me? Do we care about doctrine today? This is the thing that is going to be a hallmark of the apostate church in the last days. They won't care about doctrine. Let's play bingo. Let's have church service and just do 12 steps to financial success. Let's have a Sunday morning service on how to be happy. And you won't hear the cross, you won't hear the Christ, you won't hear about sin, you won't hear about heaven, and you won't hear about hell. It's all about now. This is it. Grab it. Dangerous. Leaven at work. Galatians 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. Paul says to the church at Galatia, you ran well. Man, you guys took off like a rocket. Who hindered you? from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You hear that? Wow. Church, listen. I believe that that can happen now. I believe it is happening now in the church in the world and certainly the church in America. As I said before, churches have never been bigger in America Think about it. Think, 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 think. Churches have never been bigger. So why is this nation so messed up? Churches have never been bigger. So why are Christian marriages failing? Churches have never been bigger. So why are we losing 88% of our young people after they enter their fourth year of university time and they have no faith? You see what I'm saying? We're in the time of leaven. I go to church. Look, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I'm a full-blown atheist, I'm comfortable with the guy. I'm telling you right now, I am totally comfortable with him. You want to know why? I know what to expect from him, and I know what not to expect from him. He's an atheist. When somebody comes, and I don't know who they are, and they say, I'm a Christian, now it's like, oh, man. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Well, pastor, that's fair. You should... You should look for the best in all people. (laughs) Not going to do it. No, uh uh-uh. Jesus said, examine their fruit. (laughs) Watch their lives and then make a decision. That's so unloving. (laughs) No, you got your words all messed up. No. Dangers from within. Galatians chapter 6. Okay, look, Galatians 6, 1. How do we respond to people? What, what, what if there's somebody in the body that is messed up? Oh, well, listen, that's cool. In Galatians 6, 1, the Bible says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, which is the law of love. Okay, that's great. That's in the midst of all of us. Watch, everybody. In the midst of us loving on each other, Okay, there will always be wherever God's at work. Look, I don't want to freak you out, but I pray that God's at work in this church. Do you want God to work in this church? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Just know this. Wherever God's at work, Satan sends his goobers. It's part of the deal. It's part of the deal. You buy a burger. I'd like to have that burger, please, with no tomatoes. 
And then you pull up and you get it and you bite into it. It's just tomatoes. And everybody, you know, I told you not to do tomatoes. Well, it comes with tomatoes. It comes with tomatoes. Listen, the church comes with weirdos. <laughs> wherever, there, wherever God is moving, if you, think, if you don't like what I'm saying, Jesus pastored a church of how many people? Jesus was a pastor of a church of 12. And one of them was possessed by Satan. Hello. Think of that. You didn't think of that, did you? Some guy over here just going, I never thought of that. <laughs> it's true. Satan is always out to stop what God's doing. So I hope there's some weirdos here. We need, you know, some weirdos here to be biblical. <laughs> These who will infiltrate, by the way, there'll be those who promote sin within their church by, by ignoring it. Well, we've never heard our pastor ever preach on that issue or say anything about it. There'll be pastors who will say, or church leaders who will say, well, we never addressed that, that issue. And I think that pastor should be taken out into the uh, street and talked to. What do you mean you never? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Ezekiel, if you see evil coming toward your people and you don't blow the trumpet to warn them, and the evil gets inside of them, God says, I'm going to require their blood from your hands. That's the ministry of a pastor teacher. Did you know that? You're to blow the trumpet. It's not a popular job. People will hate you. Who cares? You and I want, and we are pursuing the smile of God. And you see, when we think, well, I don't know, man, I died. Leaven is creeping in. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, test, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. The word test means acid wash it, pour acid on it, see if it holds up. The word to hold fast means seize it. So listen to this, pour acid on it, what's being declared. And if it makes the test, passes the test, hang on to it. And while you're doing that, stay away from all appearances of evil. Take responsibility for your actions and fight on with God. Listen, very quickly, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 to 12, it is an awesome portion of Scripture. I pray for this church that we would be this church in Revelation 3. I don't want to be any of the other churches in the book of Revelation but this one. In the letters to the seven churches, Jesus wrote to the church of Philadelphia, not Pennsylvania, in Turkey. <laughs> you Liberty Bell and all that stuff? No. This is 2,000 years ago in Turkey. And Jesus said unto the angel of the church at Philadelphia, write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key to David, the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, I know your works. Behold or see, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Here's, this is awesome. This is my prayer for us. For you have a little strength, you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, Replacement theology people. But lie, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Tribulation period. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. That is awesome. That's who 
I pray we are. Jesus, the Bible, challenges us to be ready for the last days and for a time of apostasy. In 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times of the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Tragic. And the third and final thing is this, dangers from without. Now, we're going to go through this. I, I, there's no way I'm going to cut this short because um, we, it's too valuable. I want all of you to wake up now. It's time to wake your friend up. Wake him up. Get him ready. Got to write this down. This is serious business. Dangers from without. <clears throat> Jesus made it very clear that you and I have an enemy. He's the devil. I don't believe in the devil. Then he's got you snookered. <laughs> Jesus believed in the devil. Called him Satan, Lucifer, the son of perdition. He's the highest order of created angel. And he hates you. He wants to totally destroy your life. He wants your life ruined. And from the very beginning, he has sought to unhinge humanity. Because God loves humans. Jesus did not die on the cross for one angel. Think of it. The angels that the Bible says, one-third of the angelic host, which rebelled against God, we don't have any idea how many of that is. They're lost forever. No one is redeemed by the blood of Jesus but a human being. Think of that. If Jesus wanted to redeem poodles, he would have come as a poodle. If Jesus wanted to redeem angels, he would have come as an angel. I thank God there was no angel on the cross. I thank God there was no great Dane on the cross. There was Jesus, the man on the cross. Why? Because he died to redeem us. No other thing has been created in the image of God but you. And Satan hates your guts for that, though you've never met him. You've never done anything to him. You are loved by God, and that warrants the wrath of the infernal pit of hell against you because you are a dear, precious thing to God. I don't care who you are. You say, oh, I'm an atheist. God loves you. He's crazy in love with you. I'm a sinner. I got more sin stacked up. God loves you so much. He's even worked out a deal. The person who sins the most winds up loving him the most. Hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 3 and 4, to watch out, take heed in the last days because there's going to be... a Telltale sign of you living in the last days. And Jesus said, this is what it is. Take heed that nobody deceives you. By the way, you won't be deceived if you know your Bible. You don't know your Bible, you're going to get sucked down the pit. <laughs> the sucking sound. What's that? Well, if you read your Bible, you would have known what it is. <laughs> know the Bible, you won't be deceived. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets will rise up and deceive. That word means pull people off course. So listen very quickly. How do we detect a false doctrine? How do we detect false doctrine? Corrupt doctrine. Number one, mark it down quickly. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present your bodies or yourself, all of you, your mind, your heart, everything, approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know the doctrines of the Bible, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. How do you detect false doctrine? Study the Bible. Know the Bible. How do we detect a false brother? Did you know the Bible says in numerous places there's false brothers? In the church, they disguise themselves as, as brothers. Christian brothers. 2 Timothy 3.10 But you have carefully followed my doctrine. Here, listen. How do you detect false brethren? Notice the doctrine. Manner of life, how they live. Purpose, what they live for. Faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. Watch this. This is what a false brother will not put up with. Paul says, the true brothers and sisters, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, 
Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord delivered me. A false brother will not put up with all of that abuse in the name of Jesus. They wind up running. Persecu- That's why Satan doesn't want persecution to break out. Because it purifies the church and exposes the false brothers. Mark, mark this down. According to Jude 8, they cannot submit to authority. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Dignitaries means illuminaries, those that are higher up than they are. I think it's J. Vernon McGee who writes this. This is invaluable. Listen to this. What are the characteristics of false brethren? He called them the sons of Korah. What are the characteristics of the sons of Korah? They seek to overthrow a leader or leadership. They detract from the leader's ability to lead. Remember Korah, exactly. Remember Korah? You guys know who Korah is in the Bible? Korah went up against Moses. It's a great, it's an amazing event. They grumble against the leader or his or her methods of leading. They cast dissension, division, and or an ill thought among the flock about others in leadership or what is taught. They exhibit a spirit of defiance. They privately approve sins. They publicly condemn. They lack spiritual blessings or influence that lasts. They are independent, proud. They actively seek a place of authority or leadership. They attack the characteristic of leaders, arguing that they are unworthy to lead. They entice others to follow them in their own ideas. They are unwilling to repent of their divisive divisive acts. They seem to be at the core or near every controversy. They cause confusion and disorientation within a congregation. They build upon correct foundations of emotional division and church splits. Jude 12 says, they are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear. Serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 2 Timothy 4. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, to preach the word. Be ready in season and out. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, according to their own desires. Can I add this? They'll pick a ministry or a church that makes them feel good. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things and do afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Last and final reference, Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins. I'm going to borrow from a parable to explain a parable who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise. Notice, they're all virgins. Five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, isn't Jesus delayed? Didn't you, I wish he would have come back the day after I got saved. You know, where was he 35 years ago? Well, he's waiting for you. While the bridegroom is delayed, they all slumbered and slept. All ten of them were sleeping. And at midnight was heard, uh, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Verse 10, But while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. 
And the door was shut, and afterward other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you do not know, Jesus said, neither the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Those, listen, leaven will seek to rob you of your oil. What is the oil a picture of? The Holy Spirit in your life, active and alive. Church, let's pray right now, but let's pray this way, okay? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, you, as I remind you often, that you would be the pastor of this church. Jesus, I will gladly be your sheepdog outside of that. I want you to shepherd this flock. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name right now, Lord, that you would be the one with your rod and your staff, that you would go through this flock each and every day, and that you would separate, Father, the wolves from the sheep. And Father God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would, Lord, deal with the leaven that is perpetually trying to be hidden and, and tucked in to the movements and to the actions, the activities, and the doctrines of your church. That they would be exposed. God, that you would come through. And Lord, as Passover celebrates, that the leaven would be swept out of the house and cast out of the home. Lord, so you would be welcome in this church always to sweep through this place, removing the leaven. And Father, I pray that we would always be led by your Spirit to be true to the teaching of the Bible, no matter what people may think or say, no matter what our governmental leaders might do. May we decide tonight to purge from our own lives the leaven of a trendy Hollywood age, manipulation of words, fables, and the age-old deception of the sinister one, Satan himself, to compromise the very thing that will take us both now and forever into the kingdom of God, the word of God, the Bible. Father, we ask now for your continued, ongoing, and increasing presence in our lives and in this church. In Jesus' name, and all of God's lambs said, Amen. Amen.